Hi everyone, so hopefully you're all excited to hear a little bit more about what Bangor has to offer to budding zoologists. I'm Ria, I'm one of the zoology lecturers and today I'm going to give you a little bit of a snapshot into my research on animal movement ecology and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this feeds into some of the teaching on our zoology programmes. So we can start by asking what is movement ecology and why is it important? So the mechanics and the patterns of plant and animal movement have strong links to our overall understanding of nature on the whole. So movement is one of the most fundamental basic features of life and it can be defined as a change in spatial position over time. It's driven by processes acting across both space and time and it characterises every single organism at at least one stage in its life cycle. So where does this feed into zoology? Well, movement is a major determinant of animal fitness because it's critical to both survival and reproduction. It's also a key process in evolution. So many of the main events in evolution are related to a selection to facilitate movement. For example, with dinosaurs, and we see that shift from the sea to the land, that's all about adapting different kinds of movement. In ecological systems, movement is critically important to ecosystem functioning and the diversity of communities. And these are all aspects of movement ecology that we're going to look at in a little bit more detail. First of all, as zoologists, we might ask, why does an animal move? Why bother to move when it's so energetically expensive? The internal state of an animal accounts for both the physiological and the psychological state. This is when we ask what is driving the organism to fulfil one or more goals. So goals might be to find resources, so mates, food, shelter, water, or it might be to avoid risk, so predation, competition, conflict, adverse weather, and in some cases, pathogens. We can look at the proximate and ultimate evolutionary payoffs from moving, but in some cases these might be a little bit difficult to tell apart. So for example, activities like searching for food, escaping predation, finding a mate, these are all proximate payoffs that in turn fulfil ultimate goals such as gaining energy, seeking safety and reproducing. And the importance of these different goals vary over the lifetime of an individual animal. We can also look at an individual's motion capacity and this is the ability of an animal to move in different ways or by different modes and all sort of stems from biomechanical properties. Changes in motion capacity can reflect changes in an individual's internal state, for example um, key internal drivers of movement and or external factors that might be going on in the surroundings um, such as predation, conflict with humans, substrates or the change in the ground that they're walking on and the change in say for example season um, so moving from a dry to a wet season and how that might sort of change their ability to move. Um, they might also employ um, several different operational modes such as walking, running, swimming so it's all about taking that into account as well. We might also ask, how does an animal decide where and when to move? Um, movement is often connected with targets, so an individual animal might want to pursue an objective, such as a site containing food, and that might be driving their movement. Um, but targets can also be associated with sort of moving away from competition or threats. So they might decide they're not going to move towards one area, they're going to completely move away from a threat or a predator. Um, the ability to detect and respond to information about the surroundings is essential to how an animal is able to navigate um, and it might also take into account memory of prior experiences in both direct and indirect cues. For example, um, olfactory, they might recognise a certain smell and associate that with perhaps something negative, um, mate choice, audio cues, so listening to sounds in their environment and also assessing threats. Well, how do we measure movement? Um, so there's 
so there are different metrics, I guess, that we can use to measure movement. But the most common is to look at an animal's home range. So the home range of an animal is defined as the area traversed by the individual in its normal activities of food gathering, mating and caring for young. Individuals utilise space and make movement decisions based on interactions between multiple intrinsic, so energetic, nutritional demands and extrinsic factors such as service water availability um, or forage availability. And we might also want to look at how consistent animals are in maintaining the home range. So for this, we could look at um, a measurement called home range fidelity. How site faithful is an animal? And studies show it's common for individuals of different species to return to areas of higher productivity. Um, so, for example, elephants are known to return to areas um, with more abundant greener vegetation. Um, and by maintaining a home range fidelity, individuals are able to sort of maximise their fitness because they're reducing their energy expenditure by travelling elsewhere. Analysing home range fidelity can be really useful to us as zoologists um, for understanding consistency in movement behaviour of animals and also the predictability of the habitats that they're occupying. But it's important to think about the key drivers of movement, particularly along the lines of trade off decisions that animals have to make when they decide where to move. The main focus of my research is the key drivers of African elephant movement. Um, so we've got these really large herbivores that are living in these really, really dynamic savanna environments and they're continuously being exposed to resource variation um, in time and space. And African elephants are required to shape their movement in order to fulfil um, their such large energetic requirements and nutritional demand. And when resource distribution resource distribution is constantly sort of changing in predictability across these habitats um, so their main aim is to sort of maximize the energetic input um, and in doing this individuals might demonstrate high levels of site fidelity by accessing familiar areas that they already know have sort of higher vegetation productivity. Considering the fact that they spend sort of 70 to 90 percent of their time overall foraging, it's really important that they can evaluate the best sort of foraging strategies for their family groups to ultimately ensure survival. So my research is part of um, a larger collaborative project. Um, the data is really unique in the fact that there's so much of it. So the um, GPS collar data was sent from our main collaborators in the University of KwaZulu Natal. We also have a vast amount of environmental data from South African National Parks. So they started collaring the family groups of elephants in 2006 and some of the collars run all the way up to 2016. The collars record GPS fixes um, every half an hour. So we have 48 data points per day for all 13 family groups. A lot of data. Um, and the elephants are based in Kruger National Park in South Africa, which is approximately the same size as Wales. Um, just to give you that comparison, uh, it's a fence reserve and really, really popular with tourists. The most amazing place. Um, and what I'm really looking at is how elephants are responding to sort of periods of resource scarcity um, or abundance and do they decide to sort of move and exhibit infidelity or do they maintain the site fidelity and ultimately maximise energy expenditure. So I have some third year dissertation students that are working on sort of chunks of the data comparing movement patterns between the wet and the dry season. And this is an opportunity for third year students every year when the project choices go out. I always take a lump of them and they really enjoy working on the data and they've been extracting some really, really interesting things. So as you can see from this image here, which shows two home ranges overlaid on top of each other, the elephants in Kruger National Park we have found are remarkably consistent in seasonal range fidelity. Okay, so what we've found is they really sort of try and maximise a seasonal rainfall event. So these are rainfall events that occur when we would usually expect dry weather. Um, so from summer to autumn and autumn to winter at, ta at these times when really there should be reduced rainfall um, but rainfall events somehow 
still occur. Um, elephants choose to sort of maximise this opportunity and stay where they are during these times. So why is all of this important? Well, sort of going into movement research, um, I found really, really interesting because overall, we're able to better predict responses of elephants to future environmental changes. And I think that's really key. We're looking at how they respond during periods of resource scarcity, resource abundance, maybe what happens when there's a drought. And ultimately, what we really want to think about is how our elephants will respond to climate change in years to come. So we can continue to develop our understanding about the susceptibility of elephants as a species to climatic variation and sort of the consequential resource variability that might occur from them moving to different areas. This all helps with the sustainable management of populations in reserves. We can ensure that sort of any management interventions that occur um, are as well informed as they can be. So that might be with altering artificial water provision within national parks or changing fencing it all sort of interchanges with each other um we've got this massive massive keystone species um and when the decisions that they make are amplified across entire populations their sort of movements um are detrimental in determining the effects on communities and ecosystems and the wider effects really um and it's important that we can sort of try and predict how spatial distribution of herbivores and predators might be impacted. So we actually took some students to Kruger in 2018 and we were really lucky. So a whole range of African wildlife there. We had the most amazing time. Um, the students got really stuck into making the field notebooks, taking lots of pictures. We got quite close <laughs> at some points. Um, so if field work is your thing, we really, really do have a range of exciting overseas and local field trips on offer at Bangor. Um, there's something to suit everybody, really. So you might all be thinking now that this all sounds really good, um, but where might a zoology degree take me? What is my what will be my ultimate career path? What do I want to do? Um, well, there are a range of different career options depending on what your interests are. I actually graduated from Bangor with a zoology with animal behaviour degree in 2013 and prior to starting my degree I didn't have a clue <laughs> what I wanted to do at all um, and that's perfectly fine if you don't know what you want to do yet. I just thought I'll choose a subject that I know I'm really really going to enjoy and I'll just see where it takes me. Um, so during my degree I got really really stuck into the fieldwork side of things and um, had a few opportunities within Bangor and for one of these I ended up in South Africa one summer um, for six weeks tracking elephants and recording behavioural observations at a different reserve in South Africa and this was organised through an external organisation called Operation Wallacea and they work with Bangor to provide students with sort of extended stays in the field over the summer time. They have lots of opportunities to go to really interesting places. Um, so I absolutely love that. And following my degree, following graduating from my degree, I thought I really want to do something with elephants. Um, so I spent a period of time working within the zoo industry. And um, so I started off as a training elephant keeper at Chester Zoo. And I then moved to Knowles Safari Park um, to be a keeper on the walk around area and also a presenter at the same time on the education team. And it was from sort of then really that I decided that I absolutely love teaching. Um, I came back to Bangor later down the line and I started as a teaching assistant and um, completed my teaching qualifications and began working on my PhD research on elephant movement in Kruger National Park. It's sort of taken me um, to lots of different places. I got to present my research at the International Mammalogical Congress in Australia. I've taken students across to Tanzania to do field work there on cichlid fish. Um, but more recently, I've been working on developing modules in animal management for our zoology students. And within this, I've sort of spent a lot of time down at our university research farm, Henweiss, um, assisting students in the development of their animal husbandry skills. Um, we have placement students and also a set of student volunteers that do various different things with our alpacas and our sheep. You can see some pictures there. 
Um, there's a lot of opportunities for students to get stuck in into all different elements of animal husbandry. So we have the basic husbandry, looking after them, recording the behaviours, trying to sort of work out who's who and who belongs where in the pecking order with the alpacas and um, the three boys. Yeah. Um, and the students just absolutely enjoy, just love going down there, being in the field with them. We have some students collecting fecal samples and looking at these in the lab that we've got down there, measuring body condition scores. Yeah, there's a whole sort of range of things on offer. And these are all sort of students that want to pursue a career um, within animal care or within the zoo industry. So as I say, there are many different opportunities available um, whilst you're at Bangor and you just see where your degree sort of takes you really. Um, so I hope that's you found that useful um, and I hope that we see you soon. So it's goodbye from me and from Boris, one of our alpacas. And if you have any questions, just feel free to pop them in the chat box. Bye.